Welcome. This is uh, 2048L and it's the Absolute Zero Lab. And this is a, a dry lab because we couldn't make it into the laboratory today. Um, so let's begin. So what's our title? So we're going to be, this is going to be lab. And I don't remember its number. And this is called the absolute zero lab and again you want to put down the date and you want to put down a number for each page each page you write on you put a number down for and then we have our objective and today <clears throat> we measure the temperature put down degree C because that's the scale we'll use of absolute zero using the absolute zero apparatus it's a common we we'll get to it in a minute it's a constant volume uh, pressure cylinder and then as always we compare our result with the accepted value of minus 273 degrees Celsius okay that's what we're gonna do let's have a look at the setup so this system consists of a cylinder a sphere I'm sorry and it's connected to a rod and in that rod we have a pressure gauge we need a handle on here but this gives us our pressure and this is a constant volume so this is a uh, constant volume pressure system the idea is that it volume this volume doesn't change even though we change the temperature now how do we change the temperature we can put it in a hot water bath hot water we can put it into a let's see if we can draw it similar we can put it into a warm water bath and we can put it into a cold water Now, frankly, um, we can go even colder than that, and with our current setup, we actually have a liquid nitrogen bath, which takes us to very cold temperatures, which makes our results turn out to be kind of closer. We're nowhere near uh, absolute zero. This is approaching 100, and this is approaching zero degrees C, and we're trying to point towards 
something which theory says is at minus 273 degrees C. So we're going to get there by extrapolating. So let's actually have a quick look at the apparatus. Lost my pen. So this is from the manufacturer and um, we see here's the gauge and it's got various scales on we're going to use the PSI pounds per square inch gauge there's a whole bunch of different pressure scales if each industry kind of uses its own um, so the pressure gauge is coming up many different units uh, for, for SI units we need uh, um, uh, Pascal but when you're doing ratios of things, it doesn't really matter. Um, here's the handle. This is, uh, you can fill it with, uh, uh, well, you can open it up to the atmosphere or open it up to a, a gas of nitrogen or whatever you like. And then this is the bulb down here. In order for this thing to work well, you've got to have a certain depth of liquid. You can't have the part of the sphere exposed. And actually, I don't like it to be touching the edges of the container. I like it to be just held in the fluid um, as you go from different temperatures so this temp this pressure reading changes and uh, it's important that you let it get to the stage where it has actually reached its final pressure. So let's do some theory. Well let's think back before we knew about particles inside gases and we just looked at things macroscopically so we thought in terms of pressure temperature and volume and I suppose the first person to make a contribution was Boyle Robert Boyle and basically he found out that pressure was proportional to 1 over the volume and so you can say well the combination of pressure times volume equals a constant and then later on there was Charles that's his family name and he found out that volume is proportional to temperature if you increase uh, um, if you increase the temperature for the same pressure of gas you could have a bigger volume for it and so you could turn around and say well V over T equals a constant for a, for a sample of gas and then there was Galosac and basically Galosac realized that pressure is proportional to temperature if you increase the temperature you'll increase the pressure for a given volume so it was P over T equals a constant and you're probably really familiar with these three uh, insights being put together and we say P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2 and of course T2 and these are ratios so it's the ratio of the pressures and the ratio of the volumes and the ratio of the temperatures and for two of those that's no problem if I look at, at pressure I know that um, I know what zero PSI is and I know what zero let's say meters cubed is they're pretty obvious to me but zero temperature um, zero degrees C that's not any good because zero degrees C is not no temperature zero degrees C you can get colder than zero degrees C zero degrees C was simply established using two convenient uh, measurement points uh, basically melting ice and boiling water call one zero degree C one one hundred degree C you can easily get minus degree C how can you have a minus temperature well it's easy 
if temperature is just an arbitrary thing. But if temperature is to have physical meaning, then we need to find true zero to do ratios. If I double the temperature, 10 deg 20 degrees C does not physically have twice anything when compared with 10 degrees C. It doesn't relate. It's just two arbitrary measurements. It's like, what I tell my classes, it's like you take a tall person and you take a shorter person and you say, compare their heights. And you say, well, this is, oh, this is two to one. But they're not really, because, you know, here's the person standing. When you look at that, this is going to be, oh man, that's going to be five to six, not two to one. If you don't know where the zero temperature is, it's like not knowing where the ground is. And so you can't do realistic ratios of heights. If you don't know where zero temperature is, you can't do ratios of temperatures, not in degrees centigrade, not in degrees Fahrenheit. And so it was actually 1850 when Lord Kelvin said, we have to find, find, the value of absolute zero. That is zero temperature. Now, now with hindsight, we know that means zero average kinetic energy per particle. Um, so, um, Lord Kelvin said, let's find absolute zero. Then if you double the absolute zero temperature, you have doubled your average kinetic energy per particle. And so things get better. So that's, that's what we're at. So in the lab, we set up a situation where we had, I think um, I'm looking back at an old book and we had four temperature baths. Uh, yes, four temperature baths, uh, not over a particularly large span actually this one but I don't want I don't want the, the other lab book only had three temperatures in <laughs> we have more now we have more like uh, four or five temperatures but um, in the lab we had in this case four temperatures and so we need to go from uh, uh, station to station to station data table one now I'm your, now your lab partner, so we're going to try and get this data. I'm going to go and get the values, and then we're going to write them down in, the, in a data table. Well, what are we going to measure? Well, we're going to put this apparatus into a bath, and we control the temperature of the bath. So we'll have bath temperature, and we're going to have that in degrees C. And then we're going to stand there, I'm going to stand there, with this apparatus in place, not touching the walls, just inside the fluid. And I'm going to wait until the pressure reading, the pressure, gas, oops, pressure. And this in this case is in PSI, pounds per square inch. I'm going to wait until that steadies. It takes a, a few minutes for it to steady. And the readings that I got, well, my, my student before got was 14 degrees C. Actually, we don't need to put degrees C down because it's at the top, so it's 14. And then we got 13.4 PSI. And then we got 79.5 he was using a digital thermometer, so I think that should be 14.0, and this would be 17.2, and then it was 74.8, and this was 15.6, and this was 
25.5, not very cold actually. And this was 14.8. And I don't think there's a, I'm a bit surprised there's not a colder temperature, but that's the way it goes. I think what happened here was there were three baths and I think the student went back and remeasured the second one. I have, I have no idea, I'm just, I'm just, don't make stuff up that you're not sure about Bonacristi. So, so there's our data. None of it goes anywhere near absolute zero. And so we need to do a thing called extrapolating. So what's going to happen? So let me, let's remind ourselves. Um, so just wait before you copy this down. When you're going to do, you're going to plot a graph, it's going to be full scale. You're going to go three or four steps up from the bottom. And you're going to draw a nice line with a ruler. You're going to go three or four steps up in from the side. You're going to draw a nice line from the ruler. And we're going to have pressure in PSI. And we're going to have temperature in degree C. Now, this is where a little bit of knowledge is really useful. We know that absolute zero is about I don't know, 300 minus 275 to 300 degrees. If I did things right, I want to get zero PSI on my graph because that's the pressure of absolute zero. Zero PSI is the pressure of absolute zero. And when I look at my vertical scale, which is going to be PSI, the biggest number I have is... 17.2 uh, so I'm going to start counting little squares I'll go 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 and I'm not halfway up the page so then I'll double it and I'll go two little squares so you know 1 2 gives me 1 3 4 gives me 2 and so on I count so effectively I count to about 36 and if I'm over halfway, I'm happy. And if I'm not over halfway, I'll continue increasing my scale. How many little squares equal one big square? E equal one big unit. And I don't use three little squares. So I can use one little square for one unit, two little squares for one unit, never three. Four little squares for one unit's okay. Five little squares for one unit's okay never uh, uh, six, never seven, eight little squares is okay, nine, never nine, and ten little squares. Um, my recollection is if you count one for one, it should be about okay, uh, depending on which way you have your book. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Ooh, I hope I did enough space. What do I want to go up to? I want to go up to in terms of pressure. Oh, I want it to go up to uh, 17. So, okay. <laughs> so, let's have a look. That's going to be... Uh, Five, ten, yeah, that'll work. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. And I had twenty-five on there. I didn't need to go that far. My my seventeen is over halfway up the page, so I am happy with this. Biggest scale that's convenient. Now, if I look horizontally, I want to look at the temperature, but you know, I want to go down to at least minus 300 if not minus 400 and I want to go up to a hundred so let's say minus 400 to 100 is five bits so I count along and I go one two three four five let's go minus 400 minus 300 one two three four five minus 200 one two three four five 
minus 100, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 100, and this is in degrees C. So again, you're going to try, you know, you got 500, one little square for one thing is not going to work. So maybe one little square for 10, try that. Maybe one little square for 20, maybe one little square for 50. As long as you get over halfway across the page, you're happy. And then I look, I'm going to look briefly at what these, these numbers are. And I'm going to show it kind of like the way that uh, uh, it's going to be, roughly. So I have 14 degrees, 14 degrees. This is 0, 20, 40, so 14 degrees is like there. And the pressure reading for that is 13.4, which is there. That's my first data point. Then my second data point is uh, 17.2 is, uh, sorry, 79.5, that's basically 80. And this is 17.2. And then my next one is 74.8. That's basically so close. Ooh. And this is going to be 15.6. And then 25.5. Whoa, sorry about that. And this is 14.8. Fourteen point eight, and you're going to do that with a ruler, of course. And here are your data points, roughly speaking. Can you see how they're all bunched up? And can you also see how they are not nice and linear? The scatter on them, and that's the way most graphs turn out to be. So what I do is I get a ruler and I approach from the underneath, and I draw a line. I pay no attention to the origin, and then I get another, well, same ruler but another line, and I draw a line. And this is a range of values that correspond to my absolute value. And I'm saying it's between abs is between. And I'll do this on paper in a minute, but I'm just showing you. That's minus 220, minus 240, minus 250 degrees C, and... That's minus uh, 20, 40, 60, 80, 300, 320, 360, and minus 360 degrees C. That's what my you know, freehand graph has given me. I'm going to go away now. I'm going to plot it. I'm going to get the proper graph. This, of course, is graph one. Even though you've only got one graph, get used to putting down graph numbers. And then if you can't think of anything else put down, put down what the graph is. So it's pressure versus temperature. So you get what you're going to do. Take this data and do it. Draw your lines and see what you come up with for this range of values. I'm going to do that now. So let's have a look. This is our graph that I did on paper. This is my version of it. I actually went down to minus 500 because I thought it would be a bit more of a spread. Um, so I have my pressure 0, 5, 10, 15, 20 up here. And then I have my 
temperatures minus 500 minus 400 minus 300 minus 2 minus 1 0 and 100 and my data points my data points are here there's only four of them and they're all pretty high and ideally I'd like another data point down here and I can do that with liquid nitrogen I can be 100 minus 196 I think it is so I could be somewhere down here which would really pin down these values um, it's my judgment this is a good exercise I've got to judge where to draw these lines and I was using the back of a book as my straight edge because I left my ruler at work so shame on me and um, it's a lot harder with the back of a book but I made two judgments and you know you can second guess your judgments and the like but you just draw them through and according to these data my lowest reasonable uh, temperature absolute is minus 270 degrees and my highest reasonable absolute is minus 210 degrees so that's my data have a look at your graph and see what your data says so we need a comparison diagram this is a really good way of just comparing experimental results with expected results and my numbers are minus 210 degrees C minus 270 degrees C and minus 273 degrees C so let's go from 200 to 280 so which way around shall I do it well it doesn't really matter that much uh, let's do minus 200 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, uh, minus 250. You don't have to put all the values in. You just have to put in enough that somebody can figure out what you're doing. And this is, this is degree C, and this is experimental. And we said minus 210 and then minus 270. So my measured values are in that range there. And here's the, the rob. My accept, accepted value is minus 273 degrees C so I'm not consistent with it and because I'm saying it is the lowest reasonable value is 270 I'm a little bit outside my lowest reasonable oh no I'm no I'm beyond it yeah there's the thing about a negative scale minus 270 is here minus 273 is is outside it we count in downwards not upwards and that's the way it goes that's just the way it goes. If I'd drawn slightly different lines, I would have had a bit more wiggle room, but I did what I did. So I say, what's my conclusion? Conclusion. The measured value of the temperature of absolute zero was between minus 210 degrees C and minus 270 degrees C this is not consistent with the accepted value of minus 273 degrees C. And how do I feel about that? Well, my job is to do the experiment as professionally as I can. And 
I let the answers be the answers. And my job is then to call, is it inside or outside? And I try to let my emotions go and just call it the way it looks. Now, afterwards, I can sit down and say, man, let's have another look at that data and just check that I'm happy with it. But if I'm happy with it, I'm happy with it. Um, and I think I've, I've mentioned this before. It always crosses my mind. You know, you don't get big prizes for saying me too. You get big prizes for saying, hey, this is unexpected. And so to some extent, when you're, when you're doing cutting edge work and you find that your experimental value doesn't agree with the theory, it's a time for tremendous excitement because maybe you've discovered something that's never been seen before. Your job is to do the experiment right and call the results like an umpire calls the results and let the chips fall as they may and take pride in that. So I'll see you guys next week. Um, we'll see how it goes. Have a good week.